warm welcome to you. I'm Raman Kapoor from the Indian American Arts Council. IAC is a 21 year old cultural organization centered in New York City, dedicated to promoting the arts and artists of Indian heritage and showcasing the performing visual and literary arts. The 2021 annual literary festival runs from December 4th to December 12th. We invite you to join us in our great book selection and be a part of those conversations that will endure. Yeah. Today, it is my special pleasure to introduce someone who actually needs no introduction. She's become a household word and uh, not just in Indian American households. So Indra Nui served as chairman and CEO of PepsiCo, the Fortune 50 company. She was CEO for 16 years, a remarkable feat considering the average CEO tenure among the Fortune 500 companies is no more than five years. The first Indian American and woman of color to lead a Fortune 50 company, if I'm correct. Indra will correct me if I'm not. <laughs> she was honored by India with its top most civilian honor, the Padma Bhushan. She serves on the board of Amazon, but you will find out in the book Indra has written about her life in full work, family, and our future. Uh, the book is available on Amazon, so you, so you can access it easily. We will learn about her many other achievements, activities, and interests in the conversation you will now hear uh, with Nitin Noria, professor at the Harvard Business School, another eminent Indian American. Nitin was the 10th Dean of the Harvard Business School from 2010 to 2020, the first Indian American to hold uh, that leadership position. He serves on the board of multiple eminent corporations, including Anheuser-Busch, InBev, Mass General Hospital. Before I turn it over to Nitin, Indra, I want to tell you uh, that I chuckled at the anecdote about your dinner at the White House where the Prime Minister of India and the President of the US both were competing to claim you <laughs> as one of our own. <laughs> Today you are with a group of Indian Americans who legitimately can claim both of you 100% as our own. With that, over to you, Nathan. Thank you, Raman. Thank you, Raman. And uh, Indra, it's such a joy for me to be with you again. And for those of you who don't know her book, this is the book, uh, Indra Nui, uh, My Life in Full, Work, Family, and Our Future. Uh, I can't tell you how much I enjoyed reading this book because it also, as uh, inevitably, I think, great books make you think about your own life and your own journey. And uh, uh, I can't, there were so many places in your book where I thought about my own life and it forced me to think about it. So thank you for sharing this wonderful look at your own life and through that an opportunity for each of us to reflect on our own. Thank Someone's you, Nitin, and I hope you're going to write your book. It's a very, <laughs> very interesting story and it should be told. No, uh, your book is, uh, now makes it too daunting for anyone else to write such a book. <laughs> uh, so, look, I, what I loved about your book is, you know, you start with your childhood and I... Uh, could just visualize this, uh, your home in Madras with this magical big swing in the middle of it uh, made of rosewood, I understand. And uh, so tell us a little bit about, bring us into your home and tell us a little bit about your childhood. And, you know, people say that the values that we have in our life in the end are first embedded in our childhood. So bring us into your childhood and tell us about your childhood and what you learned during your childhood. Yeah, so... To put in context, I was born eight years after India got independence. So very early in the new free India I was born in. And um, 
I was born in the South, which was very, very conservative. And into a family where, even though we had a big house because my grandfather took all his pension money and put it into this house, um, we had to rent out many parts of the house because you know we needed the income to live. And the house itself wasn't really furnished as such. We had the big swing in the living room. Everybody used the swing as a primary furniture. In most other rooms, there were pieces of furniture, but not quite matched, but nobody cared. I never thought about it until I came to the US and started to look at matched furniture or coordinated furniture. I was happy with what we had. Um, but the house was part of a large ecosystem of cousins and aunts and uncles. And the doors were always open. Anybody could pop in. They always got a snack or a cup of coffee. So it was one of those open homes where everybody was welcome all the time. There was always life in the house. And a home where the men felt the women should be treated exactly like the boys. So the girls should be allowed to study, dream big, soar, do whatever, don't hold them back. And then a mother who said, thought that, yeah, all that's good, but I also need to make sure they get married at age 18, because that's what society expected those days. So all the women would be sitting on the swing looking at horoscopes to match all eligible girls with eligible boys. So that's what we heard on the one year, you're getting married at age 18 to one of these random guys that you're gonna pull out of this list. And on the other side, you're hearing dream big, soar, you can be anything you want. So there was this break and the accelerator both going on at the same time. But the good news is that the accelerator won over. We were allowed to do whatever we wanted, as long as we followed the rules of the house, which we always did. And my older sister Chandrika and my younger brother Nandu, uh, the three of us, uh, you know, somehow um, did quite well uh, growing up in that environment because uh, we had that foundation of the family that gave us a great uh, base from which to grow. And I'm, I always say I'm a product of my upbringing. Now, it feels like, you know, your early roots and this very close-knit family on the one hand, and yet as we all grew up in India with a larger family that seems to become a part of our family, I, I think yeah. it was such an important part of your upbringing. I was struck by a couple of things in, in that part of your book, you know, the importance of the phrase, Mata Pita Guru Devam, um, mm-hmm. And even this idea that, you know, encouragement was in the form of, yes, you've done well, but you can always do a little yep. bit better. <laughs> always. <laughs> and, oh, it was terrible. I mean, it was always, they were never happy with what we turned out. Never happy. If you got 100 in math, it's because the test was too, too easy. If you got 98 in geography, it's because in the middle of dances, you were, a, you know, another dance. So there was, I don't believe we ever got compliments. And we never got a hug and said, I love you. That, that word never existed in our vocabulary. Love was assumed. Love was and, assumed. Indra, do you think that this uh, pushed you both to excel for yourself, but has also made you a more demanding boss? I don't know. It's possible. But you know, in those days, our family was not unique. All the other families in our community were exactly the same. In fact, when the parents got together, all that they did was talk about the kids' grades. That's all. Everybody pulled out the report cards and said, oh my God, your son has a problem in this subject. My daughter has a problem in this subject. That is all the conversation that happened for the first half hour. And so when you grow up in that environment, you realize that you're not growing up in an unusual home. That is how households were those days. That's how parents were those days. My luck was that I had a grandfather who nurtured us, supported us, and developed us. But he did tell us that if you promise to deliver something, I don't care if you're dying, you better deliver it. Reliability is everything. And if you stop learning, you'll atrophy. And uh, he said, always do things to the absolute best of your ability. And when I later on became CEO, I followed those rules. I felt that I had to push people to improve the standard of their output because you know, if I didn't raise their bar, who's going to? So I don't know if I was a demanding boss. I was a uh, boss with high standards. Yeah. If you call that I, demanding, I'll take it. No, I'm, I, you know, I, I have, uh, as I was reading about your childhood and that phrase, I was struck by the fact that, you know, these days in parenting, they say, you know, the first thing you should say to your children is I love you and how they excel at everything. And we, neither of us grew up that way. And I think- no, not, <laughs> at all. not at all. <laughs> and it made me sometimes wonder, you know, whether we're, the, we're better for that kind of childhood or whether the- I don't know, Nathan. I think sometimes our kids tell us that, 
uh, you know, we were too tough on them, especially our first kids tell us that we were too tough on them. Can't do anything about the past. It's over. Got to move yeah, forward. Absolutely. So listen, I, I, uh, let's move forward and talk about your first job. You, you spend a good bit of, bit of time talking about it at Meta Beard Cell, if I got the pronunciation mm -hmm. of that right. And the deeply important role that these two early people played in your life, uh, Norman and Mr. Rao. Can you just tell us about that first job? I think first jobs are these magical moments in our life. Yeah. Well, I graduated from IM Cal and went to join Meta Beard Cell. It was a Madras-based company. And Madras was a sleepy city those days, not too many big companies headquartered there. This was a British multinational, relatively small, uh, but, you know, British multinational. And uh, uh, they always had a managing director that came from England, and then all other managers were from the local, uh, you know, leadership. Uh, women were not, uh, you know, large numbers in the IIMs those days. In my class, there were five women in the class ahead of me. There were five, because I think there were 10 or 12 dorm rooms. So they recruited as many women as they could just fill that dorm room, nothing else. Uh, and so when we went into the workplace, we were among the early people, early women in the workplace. So in Metro Beard, so I was the first woman from a business school to come to work. And so Norman Wade would just come in there, thought that was interesting that Metro Beard had hired a woman from IM Cal, and she accepted to come to work in this uh, British uh, company that was very narrow in its offering. And SL Rao, who hired me, uh, said, hey, I want to uh, develop this person because all the men tried to talk over her in the interview and she pushed them back. So there must be something there. So you had these two men who were both, SL Rao was known for his tough style and high standards. And you had Norman Wade, of course, we all revered these British guys who came, whatever their caliber was. So you had these two people who were at least three levels above me taking a particular interest in me, much to the surprise of many other people around me. But I couldn't do anything about it. If Norman Wade shows up home, what am I going to say? Don't come home. He came home. And if Vessel Ra stopped by my desk to say, how's it going? I had to give him an answer. A lot of people in the company wondered what the hell was going on. But unbelievable mentors, unbelievable mentors. I love the story about how from there you went to Johnson & Johnson and both of them were quite encouraging of you. Yeah. And then at some point you wanted to, uh, you had this big promotion, but you also had this opportunity to go to Yale. And at that time, uh, Norman Wade says, you know, if you were my, you know, I, I really want you to come back to my company, but uh, if you were my daughter, I would tell you to go to Yale. Uh, so you go to Yale and uh, this is the first time when uh, you, you now leave India and you begin to embrace and be a part of this country. I was struck by the years of, at Yale, you know, family is of course such an important part of our upbringing, but it looked like at Yale, the importance of friendships uh, seems to have become something that you focused on. Like it, you, you describe your friends in a very warm and wonderful way when you describe your Yale years. So can you talk about those friendships and in general, how you think about the role of friendship in life? Because this is a book, what I liked about this book is that it yeah. tells us a lot about our careers, but it also tells us about all the other things that make up our lives. I think family, uh, traditional family, you know, parents, grandparents, cousins, that was the way I grew up in India. You come to the US and there is no traditional family support right here. So you evolve a social infrastructure, if you want to call it that, a support system based on friends. Friends who support you, who pick you up when you're down, um, give you... Uh, advice when you need it, take you when you take you in the car to the grocery store when you need it, um, you know, bring you a tablet when you have a headache, little things that family members did for you, friends did that. And so, in a way, the family in India was replaced by this group of friends in my two years at Yale, and they were simply amazing. And I would extrapolate from that, Nitin, and say in today's world where many people are not in these traditional families, where nuclear families are much smaller lots of single parent families. We have to recreate these social infrastructures and communities. Because if we don't create those, people are going to be incredibly lonely. And uh, I look at my life at Yale and say, it was a glorious time for those relationships we built there. Especially being in that horrible dorm called Helen Hadley Hall that I described <laughs> in some detail. What made up for it was the spirit inside the dorm. The big hearts, the great smells, the cuisines, the languages brought the whole world together in that drab hall. 
it looks like the other thing that these friends gave you is that they introduced you to the person who would then become your husband. So uh, maybe you well, should... they didn't introduce me. I met him on my own. But uh, what these people did was help me ease into the American culture. They taught me baseball. They taught me the language of sports. Uh, they taught me everything American in a low risk environment. And I went from somebody who was born and brought up in India, had not left the country before then, and they helped me ease in in a wonderful way. So I'm grateful to all of them. Still keep in touch with them. Yeah, I know that you've become a extraordinary fan of the Yankees. And as you were telling your stories, I was reminded of Fred Feinberg, who was equally a person whom I met as a friend when I first came to MIT, who you know, I knew none of these American sports and very quickly I became, you know, diehard fan of the Patriots, of the Celtics I and remember. Of the Red Sox. And, you know, and, and so these are stories where you just realize how much these friends were an important point, part of our passage to becoming, uh, to feel like we were welcome in this country and to become a part of it. Oh, you bet. And, you know, for them, it was a huge co commitment of time and energy to teach you these games and the terminologies right in the middle of a World Series, right in the middle of a World Series. And so... For them to be watching the World Series where the Yankees are playing the Dodgers and explain the game to me and the players to me, I thought was an enormous act of generosity. And I always I was grateful to that group. So, you know, you, you graduate from Yale SOM and uh, as with many, many people who think of what's the best first job after business yeah. school, you, not surprisingly, go to a consulting firm. So you join mm -hmm. BCG and you spend six years at uh, BCG. Uh, Talk to us about those years and tell us what were the most important memories you have of that year, of those years, and how did they contribute to the development of your leadership? Tough years and great years. Tough years because I was learning so much in such a short time. Um, you know, you go from the confines of the business school, now you're in BCG where you're talking to the C-suite of companies. And in BCG, you work on two assignments at the same time and very different industries, very different issues. You have to learn how to do time management. Uh, the time without computers, without cal you know, real advanced uh, calculating machines, so using a HP 12C at the, if you have luxuries or a simple Casio calculator to do all your calculations. So those were all, in retrospect, very tough days. Lots of travel in the Midwest and in the middle of snow and rain you traveled. Um, and through that, I had, of course, my father getting sick and I had my first child. So it was a lot happening in that time. At the same time, I learned so much about strategy, frameworks, how to bring frameworks to companies and help them think about their issues in a different way. How not to be political when you consult. Tell the CEO what they should hear, not what they would like to hear. Those, those were difficult messages, but... Uh, I learned a lot in that bargain. And I think in my six years at BCG, I must have gotten 10 or 15 years of corporate experience packed into one. And more importantly, I learned the amazing um, generosity of BCG because they gave me paid leave when my father was dying, when I had my child, when I was in the accident. And I never abused that paid leave because they gave me six months when my father was ill with pancreatic cancer. He died in three months. I came back to work a day after three months. And so I never abused a paid leave, but the generosity of BCG to put in place that program for me, because there weren't women at all for maternity leave, hardly two or three women in the whole system. And as paid leave is concerned, they had never given paid leave before. So they gave it to me. So I am deeply grateful to my BCG experience. And had I not been in the accident in 86, I might've stayed on. So God intervened and did the right thing. Yeah, and, 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 you know, we'll come to this at some point in terms of the passion that you have developed for trying to figure out a way in which we can develop a care infrastructure that supports mm -hmm. us better. And it looks like the earliest taste of that is, was BCG giving you this tremendous level of opportunity to care for your father when he was ill and to create, as you say, you know, I would never have asked BCC, BCG, it made a big difference that they volunteered to offer it yep. to me. And uh, I, I just think of that as an example in your book of how every one of us who runs companies should be more inclined to ask the question, if we care for our employees and give them the opportunity to care for others, we will get more out of them, which is clearly what happened in your relationship. Oh, with that's them. a great point, Nathan. I couldn't have asked for it because 
I didn't even know you could. I assumed that I would quit my job and just be home. And then I had no idea how I was going to re-enter the workforce. So I had all of those concerns. And I was surprised when BCG called me out of the blue and said, we've decided to give you six months with pay. Yeah. So it was remarkable. Extraordinary story brought chills to me to just know that, that a company would do that at a time that yeah. was so important to you in your life to spend time with your dad. So then, you know, you you end up meeting this amazing guy. And I, I <sighs> turns out that even I met Gerhard Schulmeier. I worked with him when you didn't, which was yeah. when he was at Siemens Nixdorf. You left him by yeah. the time. Yeah. <laughs> I worked with him when he was at Siemens Nixdorf and I, I didn't even realize we had this connection together. So uh, at some point in your book, you write that, you know, when you were uh, at BCG, uh, at uh, Motorola, where, where, is, where you know you left uh, BCG to join Motorola and Gerhard Schulmeier as uh, head of strategy. And then he was leaving uh, at some point, uh, he decided to leave uh, Motorola to join ABB and you had to decide whether you go with him or not. There's a line in your book where you say, you know, your, someone gave you advice, don't leave an institution, in this particular case, Motorola, for an individual, in this particular yeah. case, Gerhard. As you have reflected on that, what do you think of that? I think that, are that is it best to focus on institutions or is it useful at times to hitch your wagon to a person who really believes in you or you believe in like you did in Gerhard for, Gerhard for some period of time? It's a very personal thing. In my case, Gerhard stretched me in ways that I never realized I could be stretched. He gave me the most impossible assignments and I had to figure out a way into doing that. Uh, when he had to go give a speech, uh, he would find a reason not to go. He would say, but I'm gonna send Indra. I'm like, what do I have to do with the speech? He said, oh, you can do it and he'd walk away. And so what he did was he built my image. He gave me opportunities. He helped me get there. And he, he gave me incredible credibility inside the organization because he would look at a deck and say, obviously, Indra, you haven't reviewed this. Hmm. Uh, and so people immediately knew that we're better off just running it by him. And so he basically said, this is my go-to person. I believe in her and she understands me. You know, Gerhard is very German. Yeah. So I could think like Gerhard. And for all he did for me as a mentor, he, he viewed me as a talent. He didn't view me as a male or female. He just wanted me to get the work done. And so the way he and his wife cared for our family and the way he stretched me and pushed me, he deserved my undying loyalty. And so when he went to ABB and the headhunter kept calling me saying, he's looking for an Indra Nui, what does it mean? I go, I don't know, I'll do my best. I even interviewed candidates for him, but he'd look at them and say, no, won't pass, won't pass. Then I realized I better go work for this man. So, you know, ultimately I moved, we moved. Yeah. And uh, you know, then at some point he he moves to Germany, and uh, at that point it's very clear that you, as much as you might have been tempted to move with him, your family Germany was not on the cards for me. Your family was not on the cards, and Germany was not on the cards for you. And okay. so that's a point where it clearly looks like you know you privilege your family and and try to make sure. And you know, you're, throughout your book you talk about these things, and none of these things are like easy choices. You just have to wrestle right. with the choice in the moment and do what feels right to you. Yeah, and you consult your spouse. I talked to Raj extensively at that time and we both decided that with two kids and Raj fully settled in this job, now is not the time to go to Germany and we'll take our chances. I'll go find something else to do, but I'm not going to Germany. Yeah, and there's a certain sense in which you can see this turn taking that sometimes happen if you have you know, a, a partner who's also working, which is he moved from Chicago when you thought yep. the right answer was to move to ABB. And then when the next thing happened, you stayed and you found yep. the next great opportunity for you. And yep. it happened to be the company that you were very skeptical of. I was sort of so struck. I never realized <laughs> when you were first approached by Pepsi, how skeptical you were about joining Pepsi. Maybe everybody thinks that you were just naturally always born to become the leader of PepsiCo. So do you want to tell us about the story of how you uh, how I, were about yeah. PepsiCo? And how I, I was a technologist. I was a chemist by undergraduate degree. And I love technology. And ABB gave me big machinery to think about. And Motorola taught me electronics. And so I naturally gravitated towards GE. And while I was at ABB, I studied GE extensively as a competitor. Even though they were not really a competitor, we studied them extensively. So to me, 
going to GE was natural. And Jack Welch at that time was flying high. Yeah. And he was the CEO to work with. So I was naturally gravitating towards GE when uh, PepsiCo reached out. And I interviewed with them and found them to be wonderful people, Wayne Calloway and Bob Detmer and all the people. And I told Wayne, who was on the GE board, I said, Wayne, I'll give you an answer on a certain date. I'd given both GE and PepsiCo the same answer. On the date, I'll give them my response. And uh, Wayne calls me in the ABB office and says, Indra, I was just at the GE board meeting and Jack indicated that you might be joining GE. And this is the prince of a man, Wayne, as he says, I understand why you'd want to join GE. Jack is a fantastic CEO. GE is a great company. And you know, I know exactly why you'd want to join them. But he said, I just want to make my case. And then a man who doesn't talk much huh. proceeds to make his case as to why his need for somebody like me is more than Jack's need for somebody like me. PepsiCo has never had somebody like you with a global thinking, a woman from an overseas market in the C-suite. Need you, need you to come and shake up this culture. And in return, I promise you that you will be developed, you'll be coached, and you'll be mentored like you know, nobody has ever been. So he made such a humble plea that sat back and I said, I want to join this institution because in many ways, with GE, I would have been joining an individual. Um, there was a very interesting exchange between me and the uh, vice chair of GE. And when I went, met, him, met him, he said, Indra, everybody's talking about you. And we really want you to join GE. I looked at him and said, look, I've talked to nobody besides Jack. So how can everybody be talking about me? He looked at me straight in the face and said, because Jack is everybody. <laughs> <laughs> and so once again, we're at this institution and the individual. Uh, in this case, I joined the institution that was PepsiCo. That's a wonderful, wonderful <laughs> story. So, so there's a line about that you write about when you join PepsiCo, which is you say, you know, uh, white American men held 15 of the top 15 jobs when I joined PepsiCo. From that moment to becoming the first Indian American CEO and woman to run a company like that. Yeah. Tell us how that journey <laughs> occurred because it was not, it didn't play out quite the way you thought it would, right? At various times you thought you would go run a PL, but you ended yeah. up staying in strategy, then you became CFO. So give us a little bit of how you join a company where you don't look like you're from central casting at all. And then you end up becoming the central person. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, when I was thinking about PepsiCo. A couple of headhunters who'd heard about it called me and said, oh, no, no, you shouldn't join PepsiCo. I said, why? I said, because to join PepsiCo, you have to be called Pepsi Pretty, which is a certain mold. But let me give you the flip side, Nathan. That was the ideal C-suite executive in corporate America those days. Yeah. So PepsiCo was no exception. You know, when, in retrospect, it sounds like an exception. PepsiCo is just like any other company. What nobody realized is that when I joined PepsiCo, because of Wayne Calloway and the respect they had in the company, everybody, most people reached out and wanted you to succeed and helped you and you know, gave you all the time in the world, uh, you know, took you themselves into plants and route rides for you to learn the business. So I had an outpouring of support from people in PepsiCo, um, from most of them. Uh, and so it was an easy uh, assimilation into PepsiCo. And I had to work my tail off because very soon after I got there, Roger came back to run restaurants. So now I had to learn the restaurant business I knew nothing about. Roger and I, I had to learn Roger and I had to learn the restaurant business. Both, both difficult challenges because Roger Enrico was, you know, a challenge on his own. You know, I had to learn Roger Enrico. I had to learn the restaurant business. So that was a challenge. And very soon after that, of course, Wayne got sick and he stepped down and Roger became CEO. At the same time, I was going to run the European snack business. And Roger one day came to me and said, oh, I canceled your move because I have lots of operating executives, but I have no strategy executives. So I need you to stay and help me think through the future of the company. And pretty soon, I was there, wedded to PepsiCo purchase, working with Roger, uh, transforming this company, You know, getting rid of restaurants, bottling, buying Tropicana, buying Quaker Oats. It was one of the most hectic periods in my life. 
And, um, you know, Roger was a tough boss, very interesting boss. He took to very few people, but he took to me. And so, you know, I was willing to do all that I needed to do to further the company because my boss believed in me and my colleagues believed in me. You seem to have had this pattern throughout your career that somehow the people who were your bosses, uh, as you yourself know, all of them men, all of them male mentors, really seemed to believe in you, gave you opportunities that, uh, you know, were demanding. You seem to rise to those opportunities, but they invested a lot in you. Is there, have you ever thought about like, what is it about you that leads people to have that willingness to invest in you? And because I think it may be, I actually think it's much more about you than it is about them. Well, Nitin, I, in retrospect, I've been thinking about this a lot, especially as I manage, managed a lot of people uh, through my time at PepsiCo and even now, um, the amount of effort I put into my job was unbelievable. I gave up a lot to deliver a great product. And I was singularly focused on one thing. Once I turned in a product to my boss, I wanted the product to be almost perfect. You can make small changes in the margin, but I should be able to anticipate what the project needed, not what you need, what the project needs, give you a great product, and for you to say, if Indra has done it, I don't need to check it. Hmm. I, I wanted them to have that level of comfort. And the other thing I always did was, if I saw them give a presentation or something like that, I'd look to see where they struggled. And I would go engineer all of the transitions to make life easier for them. So what they saw in me, somebody who turned in a very high quality product, who made their life easier, and they knew that they could count on me for anything. And they had my complete and total loyalty, not blind loyalty, because if I didn't like something, I would go in there and I wouldn't stop until they heard me. Roger would always say she's like a dog with a bone because if I got my teeth into something which I thought had to change, I would be back in his office every which way, reconceptualizing the situation and saying, we got to look at this, we've got to look at this. I'll wear him down. He was my next door neighbor, so I could easily wear him down by dropping stuff off in his mailbox. And so, you know, it's not that I did what they wanted me to do, but when I was asked to solve a problem, I redefined the problem in a much more expansive way and gave them a complete solution with you know, checking the facts, checking the presentation, everything end to end, so they never had to work. When was the first time that you imagined that one day you could be CEO of Pepsi? Was there a moment when that even became a possibility or, or was it at some point, you know, when you were asked to take on the role, it was still a surprise? I, um, I knew the CEO job because I was working so closely with Roger and so closely with Steve. So I knew everything about the job and both Roger and Steve inv involved me in everything they were doing. So um, I felt part, an integral part of the CEO's office. Uh, I knew about every business, every lever of every business, every partner, every bottling partner I knew. I knew our competitors. There isn't a thing about the business that I didn't really know. On the other hand, you know, Steve was very young when he stepped down. He did it because he wanted to be with his family in Dallas. So he's a very, very upright person who believed that his family came first. And so he shocked me when he said he's stepping down. Hmm. Never expected him to step down so early. And so uh, he and I had a great relationship. And um, when he walked into my house that Monday morning and said, this weekend, the board's going to meet and vote you in as CEO, go off and get everything done. I'm like, why are you stepping down? Or as my mother said, let me call him. He listens to me. I'll tell him to stay on. You don't need this job. But I think that none of us expected Steve to step down. When he did. Nobody. So, you know, but once you become CEO, you're it. You just have to, you just have to, uh, you know, go on. Uh, your time as CEO at Pepsi is so defined by something that now, of course, everybody talks about, which is mm -hmm. the importance of purpose has grown in the last 20 years. But mm -hmm. when you first introduced this idea of uh, performance with purpose, uh, it was a new idea. What was the inspiration for that idea? Uh, 
it's not like you just got immediate approval for it. Today, when CEOs talk about it, everybody applauds them on the back. Uh, you had, mm. you know, you had people come at you and say, you know, just let's focus on the core Pepsi business. And you had, you know, uh, people who wanted to say uh, as activists that this was the right, uh, that this was, you know, so, so you had a fair number of skeptics uh, along the way. So tell us about where you derived that conviction for and how you drove that idea in your time as a leader of PepsiCo? The big difference between what I was doing and what people are doing now, today purpose is viewed as a special program that companies have to undertake. Okay, uh, you know, people are trying to figure out how to do purpose management. For me, purpose was what we needed to do to future-proof the company. Uh, and purpose was not a word. Purpose was three main planks transforming the product portfolio, worrying about our impact on the environment and worrying about our people. And had we not done those three, our growth would have been severely curtailed and our costs would have gone up because had we not transformed the portfolio, we wouldn't have kept growing. Had we not worried about the environmental footprint, our costs would have gone up. And worse still, we would not have had a license to operate in many societies around the world. And at a time when most young talented people wanted to go into consulting or tech industry or fin, fin, you know, uh, Wall Street, we needed them to come to sleepy old CPG. So we had to create a completely different environment in the company. So our purpose was about future-proofing the company. It was an integral part of our performance of the company. And we believed it, and I believed it in my head, heart, and hands that if we didn't do this, we wouldn't have a successful company. It wasn't an extracurricular activity for us. This was our curriculum. And I think that's the big difference between then and now. Today it's viewed as, oh my God, ESG metrics. Uh, you know, you can't look at it as ESG metrics. You've got to look at what kind of a company do you want to run that leaves a positive impact on society? That's the way you've got to think about it. In, in many ways, uh, the management of the company uh, picks up on another thing that you talk about in your book, which is the vital role that dualities play in our life, whether mm. it's work life, whether it's, uh, you know, profit and purpose yeah. purpose and performance. Uh, you seem to have done a very good job in some ways of navigating these dualities in, in a wide variety of ways. Uh, as you thought about navigating this duality within the company, as you said, you know, it's very easy for purpose to become People can become cynical. They can say this is greenwashing and you really try to embed it into the core of the performance of the company, as you said. So when, you're, when you are dealing with these competing tensions, how do you make sure that they can each get the energy and attention that they deserve? You know, the definition of what we're doing on the purpose came about because very early in my tenure, I, I identified the 10 megatrends that are going to impact the company over the next decade or two. And we refresh that every two years. And for each of these megatrends, we translated them to what changes do we need to make in the company? What new capabilities do we need to build? What investments do we need to make? All of that stuff. So it was a very detailed, in-depth look. And once we got the board to buy into that, it was a great blueprint with which to run the company. So this wasn't me just saying, okay, what do I do for purpose so that I can go out and say I have purpose? Remember, I'm saying, I want to make sure this company is successful for the long term. And to future-proof a company takes time, especially in a changing marketplace like our business was in. So you have to identify what changes you have to make, what capabilities you have to build, make the investments, demonstrate to the company that you're serious about the change. So all of that required work, and I had to get my board on my side. So getting the board one by one fully bought into the program was a big, big task, big time commitment. But I had a very good board. So they took the time, four or five hours each. They bought into the agenda 100%. So it was easy for me to go and retool the company and get buy-in inside the company. And even though I had activists, I had investors who questioned me, I knew that if you wanted to change direction, you had to get a different CEO because I wasn't going to do anything different than performance and purpose. And the board had bought into it. So the board was very comfortable with the direction. The combination of the two allowed us to keep going that way. What did you learn about what it takes to be an effective CEO? Like just the, that particular job as a leader, which is a unique job, there's only one of those uh, mm. in any company. What, what did you learn about 
what it takes to be effective in that role versus all the other leadership roles that you've had? What's different about the CEO's job and what it takes to be effective in it, effective in it relative to the other jobs? First of all, it's a very difficult job. I mean, anybody who thinks a CEO job is a cakewalk is joking. It's a very difficult job because you're in the public eye and the private eye inside your company all the time. And so you've got to take your game up all the time because I mentioned in the book too, the distance between number one and number two is a constant. So yeah. if you want to lift the company, you've got to lift yourself. So the job of the CEO is to manage the company well, anticipate the future and be a lifelong student. So you can adapt and adopt all the technologies around the world that could come and impact your business. So it's a, it's a big job. Um, CEOs have to be supremely competent, supremely competent. You cannot be a CEO because of good looks or you know, your charisma or whatever. You've got to be supremely competent as a core. And you've got to have incredible courage and confidence. If you don't have a backbone and the resilience to do the job, I don't think you should be CEO because uh, it's just, uh, you know, uh, Steve said one thing to me. He said, look, Indra, when you uh, come into PepsiCo every morning, we always get off at the flagpole when we walk up the uh, flagstone walkway to come into PepsiCo. He said, everybody in the building is looking at you. So even if everything is looking bleak, walk with your head held high and smile. Very good advice. I did that for a few days and I said, you know what? I'm going to drive right up to the front door. Even though nobody else is allowed to drive up, I'm driving up because there were days that things were tough and I didn't want to walk straight because I was down. So I just walked in and I, you know, gave vent to how I felt behind my closed doors. Being CEO is tough. And you know what's tougher? You can't talk to anybody about it. You can't talk to your peers. You can't talk to people who report to you because they report to you. And if you go home and talk to your spouse, the little time you have with your spouse, the last thing you want to do is to discuss your problems at work. So and then if you have to follow your mother's advice, leave your crown in the crown garage. In the garage. So you've got to have humility with your power. Okay. And so I come back and say that CEOs are lonely jobs and you've got to be very strong and very resilient if you want to take on a CEO job, especially of a large multinational operating in 180 countries and you know market capitalization of 160 billion dollars that's a huge company in retrospect you know you had such a extraordinary performance record at pepsi and all of the ways in which you actually managed to make real this idea of performance with purpose but as you have stepped away from the job now mm. is there any surprising sense of feeling good about what you did? Like, is there something that you say, I would never have guessed that this is what I would feel as happy about in my time as CEO as I now feel? I think two or three things. One is that in just in my last six years as CEO, I gave to industry nine CEOs from PepsiCo, huh. many CHROs, many CMOs. So, uh, you know, every CEO of PepsiCo uh, enhanced the Talent Academy. And I took it to a whole new level. And we had an unbelievable stable of talent. So I feel very, very good about that. And I keep in touch with most of them. Second is that I see my successor, in fact, building on performance and purpose and doing even more in that area. So he hasn't abandoned it. Even though every CEO can put their own mark on the company. Yeah. I don't say anything. I'm just watching. I'm a big shareholder in PepsiCo. I'm proud of what Ramon is doing. So in many ways, I feel good about what we did at PepsiCo, what my successor is doing, but I feel particularly good about the fact that uh, the bench of talent we developed is just second to none. I'm going to ask you one last question and then we will, uh, because it's so important. Uh, with all of this leadership capacity that you have built, uh, you have decided that one of the things that you want to focus on uh, to help us all get better at is building this care infrastructure uh, that allows us to live better lives and have greater opportunities at work. Tell us a little bit about this passion uh, as the last thought that uh, you might share with us. I mean, look, I saw a lot of women coming into the workforce and then leaving about the second or third level because they just didn't know how to balance work and family. <clears throat> because 
you know, we don't have a good childcare system in the country and it's very expensive. So people always looked at the trade-offs and said, I might as well take a much less stressful job. So we lost a lot of great talent. But the bigger issue is our essential workers. People who work in factories, in hospitals, in retail. Many of them work non-traditional hours. And uh, to them, caregiving becomes a challenge. It costs too much. It's not available. And the pandemic made it all worse. And besides calling them essential workers, we never did anything else for them. So I feel like the time has come now, uh, given the extreme stress on women, given the number of women leaving the workforce, and given the fact that people are delaying having kids at a point when, when we do need kids to pay into the social security system to take care of the aging, I think it's very important that we find all the ways we can keep women in the workforce. And one of the most important things is a care infrastructure. And I think it's high time we took stock of this and did something with it. Well, those are, it's an inspiring vision that you have. And I certainly, like you, have felt that during the pandemic, we saw the tremendous consequence of not having it. And in some ways, how we have outsourced care in some ways to our schools, you know, so when the schools- yeah, exactly it, right. The enormous pressure that we, that it, that it created on all of us as a society. Indra, it's been my- Absolute privilege to get this time with you. I so enjoyed reading your book. Uh, I, I have to say that it does, uh, you know, just there's so many places in the book where you just pause and you say you admire, both just admire your life, but it also makes you think about your own and how uh, we've each been the great beneficiaries of so many things. I'll end with one line, which is in your book, which is what I feel all the time too. Only in America, only in America are the journeys that you had possible. And we should be very proud that this is a country that allows us uh, to go full circle back to Raman, the ability to have this hyphenated identity, which is we can be Indians and we can be Americans. And I think even that is only possible only in America. So thank you for your book. Thank you for the many ways in which you inspire us. And uh, it's been a privilege to talk to you. Thank you, Nathan. And I just want everybody to know that I am in awe of you. I think you did a spectacular job as Dean of Harvard Business School. I had the privilege of co-teaching with you in a class and I felt like a student there watching your masterful uh, handling of the students. So I think in Nitinoria, we have an absolute gem of an Indian American. So it's a privilege talking with you. Raman, back to you. Thank you, Nitin, and thank you for stimulating such an engaging conversation. And that was high praise from a Yale graduate for Dean of Harvard Business School. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, you're right about, it makes you think about your own life. And uh, Indra, I must uh, thank you for being so candid also in your book about your anxieties, uh, because including that first interview that you had with ill-fitting clothes, <laughs> because, because all of us had the same tailor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. when we came from India. <laughs> <laughs> very true, very true. So we, we shared those anxieties. And, um, you know, one question, Nitin, that you asked uh, regarding being a demanding boss and Indra's thoughts on friendship. I have to tell you, uh, Indra, last night, I actually called somebody who worked for you. Mm. Uh, and he said, and I said, look, tell me three things about Indra that uh, mm. distinguish her from other uh, senior people that you met. He said there are three, the three things he pointed out. Um, and uh, Nitin, this is in response to your question. Um, he said, one is an, you know, a razor sharp mind, which defines problems in ways that you haven't seen, and she thinks much further ahead. And you come back after meeting with her and saying, hey, why didn't I think about that? <laughs> That's one. The, the second one he said is uh, compassion. Um, and he pointed, and I said to him, okay, just give me one example. That's it, no more. And he said, you know, she sent a plane to bring the mother of one of our senior managers, the court, she sent the corporate plane uh, to Italy to bring her back for an operation at Columbia Presbyterian. 
And that was just one example. And the third one that he spontaneously said, and all three were spontaneous, actually, all three comments, he said, you know, she's really a good friend. She values friendships. You know, and as they say in Hindi, dosti nibhana aata hai. You know, so that, those are, you know, three very, uh, very creditable, I thought, distinguishing um, characteristics. And uh, Nitin, those respond to a couple of items that you brought up and you asked Indra about. I thought I'd give you third party testimony to that. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Raman. Appreciate it. And, and one thing I think Nitin did not give you credit for, yeah, which is probably your most consequential achievement. And that is the marriage to Raj. Mm. <laughs> because I think without that kind of support, um, very candidly, I'm not sure that uh, anyone can be as successful as you were and still have a family life. So, so I think without a husband, I wouldn't have had a family. That's for sure. Um. <laughs> <laughs> no, without I'm, a supportive husband, you wouldn't have had. Uh, you know, <laughs> let's let's give full work. credit to, to Raj because I met him and he's just uh, a gem of a person. He so. is. That he is. I can guarantee you that. He's wonderful. Yeah. And so let me, you know, Nathan, you've covered everything that needed to be covered and more. And, uh, you know, made us think it, it was indeed, as you said, a stimulating conversation that makes you think about your own life and purpose. And Indra, when you uh, have taken on any assignment, it seems as though you, one of the things you've done in great depth is research. Mm. You've always gone into it and studied it and then come, come up with a thoughtful path forward. So as you look forward yeah, to the next phase of your life, uh, how did you prepare for it? Or what, what, what have you done? What preparation, what research have you done in order to define that? Um, some of it got defined for me, Raman, because when I was stepping down, the call started to come in to be on boards, to teach, to uh, you know, serve on all kinds of commissions. The calls just kept coming. Because the announcement went out August 14th that I was stepping down and I was going to give up my CEO job October 2nd. Between August 14th and October, the phone was ringing nonstop and I you know, was looking at all these offers not knowing what to do. Um, but I thought, you know, I'd do one board, I'd do one teaching assignment. So I took Amazon, but I didn't do it until February until I stepped down as chair. Then I took on the teaching assignment to teach up at West Point because I wanted to find a way to say thank you to all those young men and women who guarantee our freedoms. And so I've been doing that now still. It's a two-year appointment. It's now into my third year. And um, right after that, the governor of Connecticut, who uh, you know went to school with me, called me and said, hey, I want you to uh, be the co-chair of the economic development of Connecticut. You don't say no to a classmate and a friend. Say, so, okay, I'll do it. Then COVID hit and he said, I want you to be chair of Reopen Connecticut. I'm like, okay, I'll be co-chair of Reopen Connecticut. So, you know, I learned a lot in the process. I learned epidemiology. I learned public health. I learned all about COVID and vaccines and masking and contact tracing, all the technologies. Um, I got to sit on all kinds of seven state coordination committees. I became a, a wonderful expert because... I studied, the job made me study. And so then I started writing the book. So right now, I don't even know that three years have passed since I stepped on, two years have passed. I have no idea. Time has flown by. And uh, now I have to figure out what to do 2023, 2024. 2022 is already booked. I gotta <laughs> think about 23 and 24. <laughs> and, Maybe take uh, a vacation, yeah. Thank you for that. <laughs> and. Uh, you know, now this is just between the two of us. Uh -huh. No one else is listening. If there are one or two positions uh, that were to be offered to you uh, that you would accept uh, in the public sphere, you know, not corporate, but in the public sphere, what would those one or two positions be? I haven't even thought about that. I mean, I'm just uh, no CEO jobs because I don't want to oh, be no, a public no. company or private company CEO. Um, 
I'm doing a lot of stuff behind the scenes to give back to society um, in my home state of Connecticut, uh, in my own way for the country. I just am not sure I want to do something very public, Raman. I've been in the public eye a lot. Even with the book, I've been a lot in the public eye. So I want to do something. I'm wired in a way that makes me want to do something, but I'd like to do it away from the public eye. Um, so I just, um, I, behind the scenes, contribution of any caliber, I mean, any, any project. That's great. That will be a challenge in itself because you're, whatever you do is going to be in the public eye. And that's the problem. The that is the problem. <laughs> so I have to figure out how to be, do something quietly. That's a big challenge I have. Well, you know, but you are a public figure and you're a great inspiration. And uh, thank you also for sharing uh, this, some of these intimate stories, anecdotes about yourself, <laughs> because it helps us relate to you. Uh, so thank you both, Nitin, Indra, terrific uh, insight, uh, you know, into just a marvelous exciting uh, story. Uh, thank we you. Will, we, we will wait for the feature film. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Rahman. I, 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 I agree with you on that. I think absolutely 100% not. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank okay. you very much. You're okay. wonderful. Thank you both. Good to see and you on both. On behalf of IAC, I want to thank Indra Nui and Nitin Noria uh, for this wonderful conversation. You can get the book on Amazon and more information on indranui.com. Uh, be sure to join us for our next program. Yeah. Uh, please check uh, our website, uh, iac.us, and see you soon. Bye for now. <laughs> Thank care. you both. Bye.